Hi, everyone. I'm attorney Donna DiMaggio Berger, and this is Take It to the Board, where we speak condo and HOA. Attorneys like to analyze and process things, but that doesn't necessarily make them good at self-analysis and processing the stressors in their lives. Serving as community association counsel can certainly accelerate burnout, given how closely we work with volunteer board members and their management professionals to solve serious problems that affect people in their homes. In today's increasingly uncivil environment, our volunteer board members and management professionals are also suffering from burnout. Can we really retrain our brains to be more resilient? Today, I am fortunate to be talking with Professor Marcia Narine Weldon about how to challenge your negative thoughts and feed your positive thoughts, as well as how the intersection of business and human rights has more impact on the community association lifestyle than you might think. Professor Weldon earned her law degree cum laude from Harvard Law School and her undergraduate degree cum laude in political science and psychology from Columbia University. After graduating, she worked as a law clerk to former Justice Marie Garibaldi of the Supreme Court of New Jersey, was a commercial litigator with Cleary Gottlieb Steen in Hamilton in New York, and as an employment lawyer with Morgan Lewis and Bacchius in Miami. She spent several years in-house as the vice president and deputy general counsel of Ryder, a publicly traded Fortune 500 company. She oversaw the company's global compliance, business ethics, privacy, government relations, environmental compliance, enterprise risk management, corporate responsibility, and labor and employment legal programs. Professor Weldon teaches legal writing, transactional lawyering, corporate compliance, and social responsibility at my alma mater, UM Law School. She's been admitted to practice in New York, New Jersey, Florida, and before the U.S. Supreme Court. She's been interviewed by the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Verge, The Guardian, NPR Marketplace, Compliance Week, and other news outlets around the world. And among all her other endeavors... Professor Weldon blogs weekly for the Business Law Professor blog. So, Professor Weldon, welcome to Take It to the Board. Thanks so much for having me. I think the thing that's actually that you didn't put in, uh, first of all, that could have been much shorter, but the thing <laughs> that you didn't put in that that is going to be really relevant to one of the things that we talk about today is that I also serve as an executive coach for lawyers and entrepreneurs and others and deal specifically with a lot of them who, because I still practice law, even with all the professor stuff. And and I'm a lawyer coach who still practices law because I love the profession, but the profession is broken. I know we're going to be talking a little bit about that today, but I see the stressors firsthand from junior associates all the way to shareholders and partners and in-house people, and it's tough. So what your uh, listeners are dealing with, it's happening throughout the profession. So I'm looking forward to talking about that today. And you are talking to a- an attorney who has gone through professional coaching. I had my professional coach on Car- Carmelo Milamachi of Ackert in, in a mm-hmm. program in mm-hmm. our first season. And uh, I will tell you that that kind of coaching really made a world of difference in my career. So I'm so excited to dig into this today with you because we, we do have so many community association attorneys who listen to the podcast. But I think a lot of what we're going to cover here, uh, Marcia, is it okay if I call you Marcia? I think Please it's going to- I think it's going to to be relatable to our stressed out board members and our stressed out management professionals. So I wanted to start out, though, with the intersection of business and human rights, because I know, you know, I've done my research on you. I've seen your 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 webinars and um, I've been fortunate enough to attend one. People talk about human rights. Can you just break it down for us to start with? What are human rights? Yeah, so that's a really important question, right? And especially because I'm assuming most of your audience is a U.S. audience, right? In the United States, we think of human rights like there's a slave and a mine and it's a child and that's it. But human rights are basically the rights that we have just because we are human beings. They are inalienable right by universal law, right? There's 30 human rights the United Nations has identified. There's actually more that people are thinking about, the right to your own data, for example. But we think about human rights as I am alive. I have freedom of association, the right to privacy, the right to work, the right to food, the right to life. Those are the basic human rights. But, you know, when you ask people in the U.S. what are human rights, they don't get it. Gender equity is a human rights issue, right? So the things that we deal with on a daily basis are human rights. Then there's a difference between civil rights, right? So civil rights are the kinds of things that you're given because the state might say you have a right to have this, or it might be a state or local or government regulation. Because you're a citizen, you're entitled to specific civil rights. Um, and sometimes the human rights and civil rights will overlap, but you want to think about it as, you know, so human rights are supposed to be universally protected. 
That doesn't happen all the time. That's why we have issues, but, but that's what we want to think about. With the rise of ESG, environmental, social, and governance factors that investors are looking at, um, when they say to companies, what are you doing on these areas? Human rights has become much more important to business, even over the past few years, where they're looking at, are there environmental factors, are there social factors, are there governance factors that investors and consumers and governments are looking at? So that's why you hear also now a much more of a prominence when businesses think about human rights. So we do, you know, I do get the uh, weekly podcast breakdown of who who listens. And we do. We're fortunate we have people listening in Europe, in Asia. But the vast majority, to your point, are Americans listening to the podcast, people that, you know, have some some connection to the community association industry. Do you think the United States is catching up with the rest of the world in terms of, you know, our stance on human rights or are we devolving? Well, it depends, right? Because again, human rights is a big thing, right? Think about human rights and the environment. We look at climate change and we look at the devastation that's happening in Texas right now and all over the world and all over the country where the rising heat and the sea levels, I was just in Amsterdam last week and the sea levels issue, those are human rights issues. You're going to have climate refugees, right? So that is a worldwide issue. When you look at the, you know, the social stuff, that's, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion. That's workplace safety. So it covers everything. And we think about governance. We look at bribery. I know there's no bribery in your homeowners associations or anything like that. But when you think about political action committees and we think about getting legislation passed, all of these are issues that touch on human rights, which is why it's becoming um, more prominent. And even in the United States, even though, again, we might not label the things human rights, but the kinds of things we're thinking about, right? So when we look at um, whether people's rights to vote, people's rights to, you know, for gay marriage, people's rights for uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, all of those are human rights issues. And in the United States, but again, around the world, I was in five countries in the past 13 days um, in Europe, right? There are tensions everywhere where I think things are devolving. I think people are angrier. We are more connected by technology than ever, but we are lonelier than ever. As a matter of fact, the U.S. Surgeon General's, you know, loneliness epidemic, people can actually live a shorter period of time. So everybody is stressed. I'm sure your listeners are stressed, um, but not just stressed, really on edge. And when it comes to that, when we're dealing with climate crisis and, you know, uh, economic headwinds and all of these things going on in elections, it tends to make people more brittle and more fragile and more irritable. And so sometimes it's just like that one more thing. If somebody just does that one thing and then you kind of go off. And so when I you know, talk to people, I try to kind of think about keeping yourself at an equilibrium so that certain things don't set you off. But, but it's difficult. I think things are devolving, not just here in the U.S., but, but around the world. In your class, you teach at the University of Miami Law School. Do you address at all what you know, I know your your focus is corporate governance right what is the responsibility of these corporations in terms of addressing and maybe even protecting human rights do you address the difference between what the what private sector should be doing versus what the government should be doing absolutely you know, don't forget that in many you know many places there are some companies that are much larger uh, they have, you know, their their revenue is larger than the GDP of many small countries, right? And in many situations, companies can be more powerful than you know, what you call states as opposed to countries, right? And so I, I do think there is a concern that, that I have that, uh, you know, let's take the United States, right? In a former life, I used to run our PAC and our lobbying and government relations. You know, I used to go train in China. They said, isn't that bribery? I said, no, it's completely legal. But in fact, you know, Companies have huge power to, to either make or break legislation. We may have seen uh, recently with, you know, artificial intelligence and Sam Altman from OpenAI and others pleading to government, please regulate us, regulate us. But that almost never happens. As a matter of fact, that never happens. This is the first time that I can remember that happening because companies, by definition, want to forestall or avoid litigation. They'd much rather regulate their own selves. And so it's, it's hard for consumers to know what to do. And when companies have the ability to tell government, we don't really like this legislation, but we think you should do that legislation. Um, and when companies are involved in, you know, helping to draft the legislation, by definition, you're going to get something that's going to favor the companies. So from a human rights perspective, the state or the country has a duty to protect human rights. Businesses, all they have to do is just, you know, respect, which means don't make it worse. And that is because businesses don't want to have any particularly legally binding 
obligations. Sometimes they do make it worse. And I, and I want to talk about that Absolutely. because we just we just concluded the, the Florida legislative session and we're mm-hmm. both sitting here in the state of Florida having this conversation. Community associations are impacted heavily by very powerful industries. I can name banking, lending, uh, banking, construction, insurance. You know, a lot of my communities are suffering with huge increases. I get calls every week from communities saying, our people just can't pay for this. We can't raise the budget this much. We're going, there are people on fixed incomes. They're not going to be able to afford this. And yet, We've got these industries going to our legislators and lobbying for new legislation that protects their business model at the expense of consumer rights in in our state. And I'm sure this is happening not only throughout the country, but throughout the globe. Um, If companies won't hold themselves to a high standard, what can consumers do? Well, here's the problem. All companies say we really care about our professional reputation. They all say that. I don't know if that's true, to be perfectly honest. And I say this because... Companies will make public statements, they'll do advertisement, they'll engage in, you know, greenwashing or other kinds of things to make themselves look like fantastic corporate citizens. Um, they might say, you know, we're really, really, really green, but they don't have any women in management, right? Or something like yeah. that, right? It's, it's what's called the CSR halo effect. People think that if something is really good in one area, if they're great with the environment, they must be great with employee relations, which is not always the case. And the thing is, consumers don't really know because Again, why don't companies want to be regulated? Because they don't want to. So what do governments do? They say, well, do some disclosures. Say what you're doing. And that way, investors and consumers can decide for themselves. Consumers don't have the time for that. You know, no consumer is going to go into Walmart and say, Johnny, I can't buy you this Nintendo game because I don't believe Nintendo is doing enough for the environment. Right? That's just not going to happen because then Johnny's going to whine and cry and you're going to be the bad mother and you're going to get the gift. Right? So, and companies know that. So, The only time that things really work is when consumers take massive action. But you have to be careful in that as well, because, for example, people might say boycott. You could boycott those companies, Mm -hmm. but, you know, and it's probably a little different in insurance. But let's say it's a clothing company. You boycott the clothing company. There are people in Bangladesh and China and Yemen that no longer have a job. Right. So there are a lot of people that are the human rights area say be careful about boycotts. And then you might have the other thing, which is a boycott. Where people yeah. say, so this happened with Chick-fil-A, when many people said, I don't want to support Chick-fil-A because of X, Y, Z. Then people said, oh, we love Chick-fil-A and we're going to counteract that. Right. So really, when consumers get themselves, where they get the knowledge in plain English, and many of these disclosures are not in plain English. So even if a consumer wanted to read it, they wouldn't. Um, but they have to take the action to call out that behavior in a way that is more sensitive than I think. I think cancel culture is a problem. But to say, you know, I'm sorry, Donna. Burger Corp said (laughs) that they do X, Y, and Z, but really they don't. Right. That's when social media campaigns can be useful because at some point it could put so much pressure that other companies may say, I don't want to do business with your company because you're tainted. Right. So whether the company will stop doing the behavior is when consumers stop buying, um, when other companies say we can't do business, when the government says we're not going to do business because your reputation that's when things happen, but consumers have to get knowledgeable and they have to act in concert because a lot of times consumers get angry and then they like, they move on to the next thing and the next outrage and the company has dodged that bullet and they don't have to worry about it. You worked at a fortune 500 company writer, and I'm wondering mm-hmm. how these companies decide who's winning and who's losing in, in, in this battle, right? For instance, you use Chick-fil-A, how many people are going to shun us because of the action we just took? And how many people are now going to love us and follow us because of the action we just took? Uh, Does shame play any sort of role? And let me give you an example that I'm thinking about in my industry, in the community association industry. Mm -hmm. As you know, we had the horrific Champlain Towers collapse. Okay. Then now the media- Down the street from my house. Okay. And Mm -hmm. the media all rushed to judgment and it's this and it's this and it's this. And we still don't know exactly what it is, but I know the New York Times just came out two weeks ago. And now the new media cycle is that they believe it's a construction defect, which is what many of us in the industry believed it was that, you know, it started out bad and gets worse from there. Right. Um, On the Mm -hmm. one hand, we have that, that just came out. On the other hand, the Florida legislature, the builders lobby, just lobbied to reduce the statute of repose in Florida for construction defects. It used to be 15 years, then it was 10 years, now it's seven years. In some communities, they don't have, well, they don't have standing until they go through transition, which is the developer sells out all its inventory. Now the governance is handed over to the volunteer board members, correct? Here's the problem. 
What are they thinking? And how do consumers find out? Should they go look and see which builders are part of the Florida Builders Association and then say, we're not going to buy homes from them if they're going to make it hard for us to, to, to ensure that we're living in, in a safe building? I mean, how convoluted can this possibly get? It, it's difficult, right? Because again, consumers either don't know, they don't have the time, and then they don't know what to do. But never underestimate the power of collective action. So a year ago, uh, a friend of mine, her daughter was killed in an apartment complex by a maintenance person because they came in, they had access to the keys. She knew a bunch of lawyers, a bunch of lawyers and a bunch of law students got together, put petitions in place. And now there's a new law, Maya's law, which deals with, and that happened in the space of a year with the Florida legislature, right? Because there was an emotional argument to be made, right? And you can't have change unless there's shared values, right? And so this is why it's hard because so many groups will want different things that they're not gonna get together, in which case the company can say, well, I'll let them fight amongst themselves, but nothing's gonna change. But when you get a bunch of people, it is a bipartisan thing. If you make the argument really, you know, Congressman Schmuckety Mo, do you really want somebody to be entering, you know, the apartment of your 17 year old daughter without any kind of notice? You probably don't. That doesn't matter what political party you're part of. So sometimes we get so focused on what parties we're in that we don't think about, okay, what's really important? What's the shared value? If the shared value is, you know, my 85 year old grandmother should be able to live in peace in a safe home. It's just all about the messaging. But so, so often we're so focused on like our political positions or our stance. Whereas really we all have this shared common interest of this. Now companies by definition, are meant to make money, right? Mm-hmm. They have shareholders. Um, and you'll find a lot of companies are now taking more of a stakeholder approach when it comes to, I care about the community, I care about other interests. Mm-hmm. But the bottom line is people want to make money. And when you have money and power conflicting with, you know, I don't want to call it the little people, but regular consumers who don't have that much power, the only way they can do it is get people in government to say, you have to think about this you as government have to think about your role. You represent all of us, not just the people who give you the PAC money. And I am the person who gave out the PAC money, right? So I am aware, (laughs) but here's what I would do. When I would go and talk to government, I would say, did you know that if you change this law this way, 4,210 of your constituents will be affected because we had it down to a science, because we knew that the main interest of that government person was to get reelected. Right. And if we could say this they is want money or votes, or money or votes. Yeah. And it's sometimes it's money and votes. So if, you know, if consumers and citizens learn how to do advocacy and there are workshops and they know the words, the phrasing, there is an art and a science to this. It's not impossible for consumers and, and residents and, to, and you know, homeowners to win. It's just a matter they have to understand the rules of the game. And, you know, we used to, uh, you know, I run an organization here at Becker called Call, the Community Association Leadership Lobby. And for years, we would do that. I remember flying up on a plane with, you know, 60 mm-hmm. community association leaders and trying to herd them around Tallahassee to meet with legislators. But there really has been a, a, a change in the winds, so to speak. I, I do think that the average person is losing a lot of ground when it comes to influence. Um, there was one glaring exception to what you said about shared values. To me, it stands out. It's it's the, do we all expect our children to be safe in schools? And I, I think everybody agrees that they want it, but there's such different the how. ideas exactly, the how. of how to accomplish it. That's the one area where I think we're not even Absolutely. close to coming up with a solution. Right. Well, we can have shared values, but that doesn't mean we're going to have a shared solution because again, everybody's going to be the shared values have to be such that we are willing to sacrifice something that is important to us for the common good. That's where I don't think we have that right now. I agree. So most community associations are not-for-profit corporations, and I'm talking to a business law professor mm-hmm. here. So we often hear, Marcia, the human rights. My rights are being trampled by people living in these communities, right? The one school of thought is my rights are being trampled if you're telling me I can't park here, or I can't have these people over as guests, or I can't have the, my pets. On the other hand, we've got people saying, you're trampling my rights. I bought in this community because these governing documents say X, and I want you to enforce it. So how do you recommend that a volunteer board of directors navigate governance when the corporation is operating and administering a private residential community? This is very different than a for-profit commercial concern, Mm -hmm. but 
I would venture to say that corporate responsibility is most important because, look, I can choose not to go shop at a certain store because I don't like their values. But if I live in this community, it's right in my face, the governance. So years ago, I was part of one of these associations, and it was difficult. It was like, my flowers, there's diff- I have too many flowers. You know, you have the garbage cans that out there. Should we find people? Can we do $100 a violation? Well, I didn't know this was a rule. It was a whole, it's, and it was, it was very stressful. Trust me. I went only because I wanted to make sure I didn't do a violation, right? I was like, let me be on this board so I make sure I don't screw up. Because, it was so, because so many people, they fall in love with, the, nobody reads the rules before they come in. They don't pay attention, right? They go, they was like, I love how everything just looks so clean and neat and wonderful. And they don't realize because there's rules to that. Yeah, how did but it get I remember that way? When we dealt with when I dealt with our association, I remember we had to really have because there was almost fisticuffs in some of these meetings, right? Um, and it really came down to what I think is a kind of roles, responsibility, and respect, right? Because let's say there's new rules going to be put into place. You know, when do the members get to be informed versus they get to review versus they have to approve something? You know, who gets to decide when there's a violation? Do people understand, you know, is there training, is there discretion, right? And, you know, do the board members believe that the process is legitimate? Because people will agree with, people will live with the decision that they don't agree with if they think the process is legitimate and fair. So if you're not enforcing the rules uniformly, right, if it's a, well, you know, she's the vice principal, so I don't want to mess up my relationship with her because my kid's in that school, so... I don't care that the begonias are, you know, six inches higher than they're supposed to be, right? That's what we would argue about, okay? <laughs> um, but if you're not doing it for everybody, it's like it's like having a boss. The boss has got to fire early and often. If Donna is a superstar and commits a violation, Donna has to get fired because if you fire Jose, who did that same violation, your process lacks all credibility. People want fairness. It's not necessarily about fairness, right? I just need to know what are the rules and is everybody going to be held to them? And if there's an exception process, what does that look like? You know, there's in business, we, and business human rights, we talk about this concept of a social license to operate. You can have all the government licenses you want, but if people don't believe you should be there, then the rebels are going to shut down your pipe, your oil pipeline, and you're not going to have any oil at the Exxon station because it doesn't matter what your business rules are, what the legal stuff are. If I don't think you're legitimate. I'm not going to support you. It's the same thing. So these boards have to have that social license to operate. Um, and, and they have to make sure that people understand with a lot of transparency, how did this decision get made? Was there an exception? Um, and then the respect, like what are the rules of debate? I was in Guatemala a few years ago and there was like a, a church, like an elder. You couldn't speak until they pointed a stick at you. Then they point the stick at you and you can speak and you get five minutes to speak and then it's done. That kind of stuff works wonders because otherwise people will go on and on for you know 45 minutes and not say a lot and they'll make speeches. So just kind of what are the rules of debate and decorum and then finally, maybe even think about a start, stop, and continue exercise, right? To get the community members together, you know, say, okay, these are our rules and regulations. Figure out, you know, with the association lawyer what can be amended and how that process works. But what should, you know, even in, in the conduct of the meeting, what should we start doing? What should we stop doing? What should we continue doing? And then if you say, look, we don't promise that we're going to do anything that you guys are suggesting, but we want to hear what you have to say. Then I say, at least pick one thing that people have suggested, because then they feel that there's buy-in in the process. And again, people will accept a decision generally, if they're reasonable, rational adults, let's put that caveat in there, that they don't agree with if they felt that they were heard. That's whether it's your community association there, or your boss. It's funny you mention that because I just had a client today ask me a question, cite to the statute and say, you know what? The statute says we have to allow owners to speak, but it doesn't say that we have to allow them to speak before we take the vote. So we'd like to take all our votes and then have them speak afterwards because it's very irritating. You know, everybody's speaking. Of course, they're not all speaking at once, but it's not productive. It's a meagerness of spirit. And in my opinion, you know, it's contrary to what the intent is, which the intent is just what you said. People want to be heard. There is a belief for many people that it's a board meeting, it's the board's business, but maybe I say something to you, Marcia, and you're just about to vote and you go, you know what? That's a good point. That's a good point. I might change my vote now, but if you make me wait till afterwards, now I have no ability to perhaps impact your decision-making. I do think there's a level of defensiveness on both sides. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you've got boards. I know I sat on my board for two years, my HOA board, 
two longest years of my life. I like to say I did it. I put in the time. It was good to do because you get that perspective. I think you do get beaten down. And particularly when you've got these communities where you've got people who've been on these boards for years, the longest person ever was, you know, I I teach classes. I'd say, keep your hands up. If you've been on the board more than 10 years, more than 20, Mm -hmm. one lady, her hand was still up at 40 years. She'd been on a condo board directors for 40 years. So, you know, yeah, she's probably a little beaten down over that time, but I think all of your points are well taken in terms of, creating the transparent environment. Some boards, I think, hunker down and they have fewer meetings when there is a lot of work to be done because they just feel like they got to get it done. My my recommendation, you have those large projects, set the expectations, let people know what's going on, communicate more, have more meetings. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if people don't want to go, they don't go, but at least they can't say, I didn't know this was happening. When did this rule change? How, how come I didn't get to get informed? And again, people can be outvoted. It's a democracy, right? But at least if they have the chance to say, and, and I think you're right, and that's why really stating kind of even what are the rules of discourse? How long do you get to talk? What are, you know, when, we, when are we going to shut you down? Because it could be that one sentence that has somebody say, I never thought about that. Okay, I'm going to change. So if you say, all right, we're going to follow the rules. The rules say that, you know, you can talk after we take the vote that has that's a process that's going to be seen as others as just it's actually going to be seen as an insult and when people are insulted they're they, they, they're even worse and then when you really need their vote for something they're not likely to be helpful and i don't know if any of your boards have term limits but i think there is a benefit to that at some point yes under the condominium act there are eight-year term limits yes. but they can be overridden you can get on and right. you can get off or if nobody else is running or if you have a a small community I want to just transition a little bit because everything we've been talking about as community association council, we're there, we're living it, you know, we're, we're kind of, you know, absorbing a lot of this. I recently attended your Florida bar webinar. Um, It's called harnessing the power of stress, developing grit and a growth mindset. I enjoyed it. And when I was watching, I said, I got to get her on the podcast. Cause again, we have a lot of community association attorneys who listen and, we're all a little stressed right now. We got a lot going on. In Florida, we're dealing with the post surfside requirements and upcoming deadlines, 2024 deadlines. We want to make sure our clients are safe. Of course, we, this is an episodic representation as Community Association Council. And by that, I mean, mm-hmm. we're not corporate counsel to a um, large, like a writer. We're not right. sitting in house. Mm-hmm. We only hear what the clients tell us. So there could be a lot right. going on over here in this community. And unless they pick up the phone or email us and say, hey, we need your help, they could be completely going off the rails and we don't know about it. So that's something that keeps me up at night as association counsel is the episodic nature of our representation. Mm -hmm. Kind of want to give our listeners a little walk through a little bit because I so loved your webinar. Um, You talk about harnessing grit. So what does grit mean to you and how do we harness it? So think about grit as you know emotional resilience. And you know, depending on how old your listeners are, like all their listeners might be thinking if they know the Gen Z or those are the Gen Zoomers, like they we joke that they have no resilience, they have no grit. Because they've never had they most parents of this younger generation has, you know, made sure they got to soccer practice and ballet practice and made sure their feet didn't have to touch the ground. And if they got a C, we were gonna complain, right? So now if there's a hard thing. So I mean, I'm also a professor and I've, I've been having like people getting a B plus and they're crying to me. They have a job already. They've graduated, but their B plus has upset their GPA. I'm thinking, wow, <laughs> it's a resilience, right? <laughs> so when you think about resilience is how do we, you know, the kind of we grow from stressors and the way to harness it is I actually say you've got to build it like a muscle, right? The more you practice doing things that are uncomfortable and difficult, the easier it's going to be. So I tell my coaching clients to do something scary or uncomfortable once a month. And it seems really stupid, but I will tell you, it has programmed my brain. So I was terrified of heights, terrified. So I've gone skydiving, all kind of crazy things, right? The other day I was dealing with something really difficult and my brain automatically said, you jumped out of a plane, you walked across hot coals, you did a sweat lodge, you can handle this. I didn't even think about it. It just automatically came because I spend time building it. Like I should probably work on my abs the way I work on my resilience, but I do it so that it snaps back. So there's very little that I go through that I'm like, I cannot handle this. Um, and you can't do that unless you make yourself uncomfortable or you don't want to dwell in suffering, right? Because that is sure. counterproductive, but don't be afraid to do things that are difficult. And when the more difficult things you do, then you're training your brain that I can do that because I already survived all that stuff. We've all already survived the worst things we've already been through. 
just to give some perspective. You know, that's the advice I give my kids. My daughter is actually leaving today to go to Lima. She's wanted to hike um, the Incan Trail at Machu Picchu. So uh, she just decided to do it. Mom is mom is a little nervous, but I'm very supportive. Of it. Go do it. You know, I'm laughing when you said the Gen Zers and how they've been parented because my, one of my friends, um, when he went to law school, actually when he went, he was going to undergrad to University of Vermont. Now remember, we didn't have cell phones back in our day and his parents actually <laughs> sent him to Canada. The flight was cheaper. <laughs> And then he had to get from Canada to Vermont and they, they didn't hear from him. He said it was a couple of days. They didn't hear from him and he had to go find a pay phone and call them. And he's a quite successful person today. So I laugh about that because that would be unheard of today for a parent Absolutely. to go. Yeah, I booked you to Canada and now you're going to have to find your way from there to Vermont and just, just hysterical. Yeah. But I, I, I love your advice Absolutely. about doing what scares you because isn't that the whole concept now in terms of, um, biohacking, you know, with the, with the saunas and the cold plunges and, and whatever it is to, to trigger certain longevity genes by putting your body through mm-hmm. certain stresses? You're talking about the mental. Though. Absolutely. That's it's both, but there's, there's a mind body connection, right? So if you think about, you know, some of the neurotransmitters and, and the hormones that affect our levels of happiness or production, productiveness or our fear factors or all those kinds of things, they all work together, right? So for example, you know, you, you talk about cold plunges, right? So you might have, people might have heard about Wim Hof or others who, you know, he's the Iron Man who's like, you know, climbed Kilimanjaro in, you know, underwear and that kind of stuff, right? With, and jumping um, in the water, yeah, the Arctic water. Mm-hmm. So, and I, so I did a cold plunge, right? I did one for the first time, you know, because I'm a lawyer. I'm like, I will outlast everybody, right? And like, just do two minutes and you'll be fine. So I did six minutes and six seconds. But you, but it's a mindset thing, right? Your physical body feels like, I think we're going to die. But when you learn how to breathe in a certain way and you work on your mindset, it is hugely empowering to be able to do something like that. Um, And that's, again, one of the scary things. But on the other hand, things like deliberate cold exposure, the science is very clear about how it can affect the neurotransmitters and how it can help reduce your stress level, how it can help raise your immune system. Now, again, as I said in the Florida bar thing, I'm not a doctor. I don't play one on TV, but I have spent a lot of time getting additional certifications with doctors and neuroscientists, et cetera. But please check with a medical practitioner before you do anything I suggest when it comes to this, because some people probably shouldn't do it. But deliberate cold exposure. Now you might say, really, I'm not sitting in an ice for six minutes. Take a cold shower. And you might say, I'm not doing that either. I live in Florida. I don't want to do that. But even the science shows, even if it's a few seconds a day, and work up to a minute a day, a few times a week, it actually has dramatic influences on, you know, again, those neurotransmitters that help your, your emotional and mental and physical state. So that's kind of one thing that people can do to help build risk. Because by the way, when you sit in the shower for the cold water, and it's cold water again, it's cold water again, um, that is also building up resilience because you're telling your body and you're telling your brain, you can do hard things. Let me and then you, if you yeah. travel a lot like me and you go to some third world country and there's no hot water, you're like, Psh, I can do this because I already do this. <laughs> I try to do a cold shower. My water in Florida, in South Florida, never gets cold enough. What people do actually, and this is another thing for to help reduce stress as we're talking about that right now, is that you can actually stick your head in a bowl of ice water um, for as long as you can stand it. What that does is there's this thing called the mammalian dive reflex. If you go, you go underwater, your brain, it says, okay, I got to make sure she's okay, all right? And your brain will start slowing down certain kinds of systems and actually will help relax you. It kicks in what's called your parasympathetic nervous system. Your sympathetic nervous system is what makes you, you know, take the car off the the child because you've got the adrenaline rush. The parasympathetic nervous system helps calm you down. Um, And so that's another thing, but the cold exposure really helps with that. Okay, I'll let you know how that goes when I stick my head in a... (laughs) In a bowl full of ice water. I'll let you know how, how I but feel about But it's that. also resilience too. But again, it's also is the resilience because again, everything that you do that's hard and uncomfortable makes it easier when you're dealing with your obnoxious Every client day. or yeah. the opposing counsel. Like I can deal with this because, because your body you again just learns to just, you learn to respond versus reacting. That makes sense. We all have stress. We all have negative thoughts from time to time. Some of us more often than others. That doesn't necessarily mean we're unhappy or unhealthy having stress and negative thoughts, does it? 
Absolutely not. And everybody has negative thoughts. And, you know, I work on my happiness like it's a full time job because there are health and longevity benefits to really trying to be learn how to be happy for no reason. Um, but, you know, I get unhappy. When I get sad. I get depressed. Um, I just don't dwell in that suffering. What's actually worse is what's like toxic positivity. Think that you must always be thinking about sunshines, rainbows and unicorns at all time because you have to think about what the negative thing is that's causing you to be unhappy. And then you have to figure out, OK, how do I get out of this? How do I retrain myself to get out of this? Right. Pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. We don't need to sit there in it forever. It's a matter of learning the tools to get yourself out of it so you can be productive. And when people can't get themselves out of that, those unhappy thoughts, those negative thoughts, that's when they can plunge into like a serious depression, um, which depression also has certain kinds of chemical risk, chemical um, components as well you can have. But, you know, when you're focused so much on things in the past that you can't control, right, all these negative things that happened, um, or, you know, serious anxiety, where you're so dwelling on things in the future that you can't control that may not even happen. When it, those issues become chronic, when it comes to the point where it stops you from being able to work, to enjoy your family, to be healthy, when you're not getting out of bed or you can't sleep, you're not eating or you're overeating, that's when you want to worry about it. I think people have a set point, like a default position. And I see this in families where you've got siblings. We all had the same experience, but some of us have a you know default to being fairly positive, happy, and others have a default to being a little more negative, a little <clears throat> more gloomy. They have actually done studies on happiness set points, um, many of them. And they say about, depending on your statistic, it's about 40% is genetic um, and 40% is, you know, is, is circumstance. So, and then, you know, there's different kinds of things, you know, environment. And then I think 10% is circumstance. I'm, I went to law school because I can't do math, right? So this is like, <laughs> so it's, you know, but that part of it, like maybe less than half is genetic, less than half is environment. That's why you might have people, if you said the same thing, like, I think she's just miserable. Doesn't matter what. We gave her ice cream. She's miserable. We took her. We took her rose cake. She's just miserable. And why is the other one happy? We didn't even give her a marble, and she's like just super happy. But there's some people that had that set point. And the good thing is that you can change. You can train yourself to. You can train your brain. You can train your physiology um, and your psychology to to get more to a happier state. Because happy employees work longer. Happy, you know, people earn more money. They live yeah. longer. You're just better to be around. So there's there's a, there's a financial and health benefits to focusing on learning to be happier, even if wondered, you came up in a miserable environment. I always wondered if birth order played a role because I'm the third out of four. I think my parents were tired by the time I got there and even more tired by the time my baby brother. My older two siblings, they had a lot more engaged um parents in terms of enforcing the rules. So I don't know, maybe because I was pretty happy go lucky. But again, I was third out of four. I wasn't one or two. So that may have had some. And, 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 and there's a whole science behind the birth order, which is not my level of expertise. <laughs> but you know, there are I was at a meeting with a bunch of really like high achieving super entrepreneurs. And I think 80% of them were the first born. It was really interesting. You know, so you do see certain kinds of things where there's a different level of intensity for the firstborn than the other ones. We're going to stop here in my conversation with Professor Weldon. Please be sure to tune into the second part of this episode where Marcia and I will dig in deeper on how community association attorneys and board members can leave the stress of board and membership meetings behind them. We'll also discuss how to cope with anxiety, stress, and depression, how to increase dopamine and serotonin, and why loyalty matters in the attorney-client relationship. Thank you for joining us today. Don't forget to follow and rate us on your favorite podcast platform or visit TakeItToTheBoard.com for more ways to connect.